Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Micah Sargent and I talk about Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter and Square, donating $1 billion to COVID-19 efforts. Also, why YouTube may actually be a better platform for online learning than Zoom. Microsoft pushing some of its highly anticipated products to next year due to COVID-19. And Emoji has some bad news as well due to COVID-19. Man, that's a lot of COVID-19. All that more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Tech News Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? Well, LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 128, recorded Thursday, April 9th, 2020. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter knows that we have to work to stay strong, connected, and focused. To find the right people for the right jobs, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash work together. And by LastPass, from access to authentication to passwords, LastPass manages every entry point to your business so you can mitigate risk while improving employee productivity. Visit LastPass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and a break in the tech news. I am Micah Sargent. Hello, Micah. I'm Jason Howell. Nice How to are meet you? you. Nice to meet you too, <laughs> sir. Shake your hand virtually <laughs> through the camera. There you go. One of good these, to see one you of again, those. sir. Yes, good to <laughs> and see you. Really, really good to see our first guest here. One of my favorites, and it's been a while since we've had Kurt Wagner on. Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter and Square Incorporated pledged $1 billion to be <laughs> earmarked for coronavirus relief. Not only is that an insane amount of money uh, for a billionaire to donate, uh, it's a considerable amount of his wealth, 28% according to Dorsey. So uh, Kurt Wagner from Bloomberg is here joining us from his home, as everyone is nowadays. Welcome to the show, Kurt. And a while, so it's good to be back. So, Kurt, you mentioned uh, in your article that this is the largest donation related to the pandemic to date. How exactly does this compare to other big name donations that are happening right now? Yeah, a billion dollars of your personal wealth is is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, we've seen, I believe, Jeff Bezos gave one hundred million dollars to uh, kind of like a, a food bank. Um, we see Mark Zuckerberg, Priscilla Chan. I think they earmarked twenty five million dollars for uh, kind of some research around finding a, a potential cure or a, vi a vaccine, excuse me, for COVID-19. So when you look at uh, $1 billion uh, flagged for this coronavirus, coronavirus relief, um, it, it really makes those um, other very sizable donations almost seem small, right? And so, um, you know, Jack Dorsey said this in his tweet storm. He was like, I really hope this um, is is kind of a a leadership moment for other people to kind of step up as well. So I have a hunch this won't be the the last person to to make a sizable uh, financial contribution to what's going on right now. Yeah, they're all gonna have to step up to uh, to be there with Jack Dorsey, good guy Jack, as I've been calling him the last twenty four hours. Uh, right. How uh, exactly is this money going to be applied to the pandemic right now, or do we even know the details there yet? So we don't know much. We know uh, it's going to be global. So this is not just going to be a U.S. Uh, based project. Um, we don't know much more beyond that. He's made uh, just one donation thus far to another uh, a food related um, charity. And uh, he also mentioned that, you know, as he gives us away and the hopefully the coronavirus relief um, improves and, and, and it's maybe no longer needed at some point in the future, he's going to actually distribute this money to other, um, things that he cares about. So he mentioned kind of women's needs as, as one women and girls needs. And then he mentioned, uh, UBI universal basic income, which is an issue he, he cares around, uh, about a lot personally. So, you know, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. Like you don't just sell a billion dollars worth of stock at one time, it's probably going to happen over uh, quarters, probably years, to be honest with you. So 
by that point, um, you hope that a lot of this money does go to those other issues simply because that means the coronavirus relief stuff has gone well. Um, so we don't know where it's going to go necessarily, but um, we will be able to, believe it or not, track it. He uh, included a link to a Google Doc where you can go in and see where he is donating this money. So we will be able to see where it goes, when it goes. Uh, we just don't know right now. Yeah. And I mean, the timing is is interesting as well. As we've talked about the last couple of months, Dorsey has really been under the crosshairs uh, from from very uh, specific shareholders, groups of shareholders that are kind of looking at his role in the company of Twitter um, and uh, scrutinizing it heavily. Let's let's just say having having potential plans uh, to maybe even, you know, kind of move him out of the way uh, in favor of someone else. Is that do you think a motivating factor here for him to come out so strongly and so heavily with this huge, insane amount of money? Um, or is he just really at, at his heart? Is he just a great guy that has has the money to burn? I think a lot of people look at billionaires and, and think, hey, they need to be giving all their money over. He's giving, you know, what is it close to 30 percent of his wealth to something, right. uh, which you know speaks volumes about his character, potentially. You know, I was thinking about that, too. I was trying to come up with, like, what what's the angle here? What am I what am I really missing? Um I think the only thing that's perhaps notable when it, when it comes to his uh, role at Twitter and, and the current um, situation that he's in is that he's not selling any Twitter stock here, right? And and um, I, I would think there's two reasons for that. The first, and, and perhaps this is really the only reason, is that most of his wealth is in Square stock. So he's kind of pulling from this much larger pool of money uh, that he has. At the same time, I... I think it would be kind of silly or, or foolish of him to sell some of his Twitter stock right now, given the fact that uh, you know he he may at some point in the future find himself in a position where he actually needs those shares, which equate to votes to maybe keep his own job. So um, it's it's I don't think he's doing this necessarily because it's going to change the perception of him in the eyes of these bankers. I mean, if we know anything about kind of hedge funds and, and bankers and activists investors, it's that they really just care about profits. And so, you know, the fact that Jack Dorsey is being a good guy isn't really going to sway their opinion of him. But I, I do think it's somewhat notable that he's only selling stock from Square simply because that that allows him to hold on to this small but somewhat meaningful uh, ownership stake that he has in Twitter. Oh, that's a that's actually a really important differentiation uh, that I hadn't caught before. So that makes a lot of sense. Now, you also wrote about Dorsey's decision to return from Africa, uh, where he had been for a little while. Why is that notable in this current situation? Why was he there to begin with? And maybe this actually ties in with exactly what we're talking about right now. But what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, it does kind of tie together. And so he he went to um, Africa in the fall, I believe it was in November, and he did a, a bunch of different uh, visits. I think he was there for almost a month. Um, and when he came home, he he basically tweeted, you know, I had a great time on the African continent, and I'll definitely be back. And in fact, I'd like to, to work and live in Africa for three to six months of 2020. And at the time, um, you know, it was definitely it kind of raised some eyebrows because people said, hey, wait a minute, you're you're a guy who has two full time jobs already. You run two publicly traded companies. Can you really do that uh, from halfway across the world? And for two or almost three months, really, it just kind of sat out there as like, oh, this seems like a, a possibly questionable decision by the CEO. Well, then all of a sudden it became a very important uh, tweet that he sent because when these activist investors came in and started looking for kind of reasons perhaps to push him out of his job at Twitter, that continually came up as like, here's a guy who already has two jobs and suddenly he might be gone for six months of the year. Is that the kind of leader that you know Twitter deserves and Twitter wants? And so we saw him a few weeks back kind of step back from that and say, Hey, listen. Uh, you know, I, I probably shouldn't have have spoken uh, so bluntly at the time. And in fact, I'm reconsidering those plans to spend extended time in Africa this year. Now, it kind of coincides with everything that's going on with coronavirus. I doubt he would be going to Africa regardless, because no one is traveling anywhere. And perhaps this is the perfect excuse not to do that trip. Uh, but I do think that there's a huge element of that, which is simply being visible and being around and now being a pretty bad time professionally for him to try and, uh, you know, work from the other side of the world. Yeah. 
Indeed, indeed. Uh, well, regardless, one billion towards you know at least earmarked for coronavirus. Um, the effort that's that's happening right now, when we're all swept up in the middle of all of this this craziness, uh, feels good to read. It was it was definitely uh, something that was that was a welcome change for some of the other news that we've been reading because that seems like yeah. a very impactful amount of money uh, coming from Dorsey. And so you got no matter how you feel about Dorsey, you have to give him total props for uh, making that decision to do that. It feels really good. Um, Kurt Wagner with Bloomberg, Bloomberg.com. Kurt, it's always great getting you on. Thank you for hopping on with us today. Where can people follow your work online? Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, Bloomberg.com. You mentioned I'm also on Twitter at Kurt Wagner 8. So uh, you can you can find me there. Right on, Kurt. Uh, uh, take care. Stay healthy. And we'll talk to you soon. You too. Take care, guys. Bye. All right. Thanks so much. Up next, one teacher says YouTube, not Zoom, is her secret weapon for teaching students remotely. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. And here's a message directly from them. Right now, we cannot be overwhelmed. We have to work to keep our loved ones safe and protect our communities. We have to work to stay strong, to stay connected, to stay focused. We have to work to inspire, to innovate, to build new solutions. But for all of this to work, we have to work together. At ZipRecruiter, we connect employers and people every day. But today is different. We are partnering with first responders, government officials, the medical community, the innovators, and the manufacturing, transportation, and food distribution industries. We want to make sure we are finding the right people for the right jobs right now. Let's work together. ZipRecruiter.com slash work together. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash work together. Thanks so much to ZipRecruiter for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. And let's talk about Zoom. No, 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 not Zoom. No, we're going to talk about <laughs> YouTube as a teaching tool. What? Uh, very excited to be joined by Sophie Lucido Johnson, uh, who has written a great article in One Zero, which is Medium's publication. Thank you for joining us, Sophie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So. I was reading through this piece and getting inspired the whole time, sort of um, and nodding my head along going, yes, preach, yes, because <laughs> there's so much in here that I I think you just really, you just, you, you, it's nail head right there. The target is there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sort of what you have uh, have written and what this piece is kind of about. You know, everybody out there is on Zoom or I just, we just got off of a Zoom call, Jason and I. Um, but you had some insights about why YouTube is a good teaching tool for you. So would you like to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I am a public school teacher and um, I, I, teach journalism. So we've talked a lot about tech in my classroom. And I happen to know that a lot of my kids don't have uh, laptops with, um, you know, functional uh, cameras that they can use to, to participate in a Zoom classroom. And then um, furthermore, a, a lot of them are um, watching siblings or needing to take care of parents. And there's just a lot more going on in their lives than there would be during an ordinary school day. And it's hard for them to access Zoom. So that being sort of the main way that we're teaching is is sort of a problem with a lot of populations. I know it's not just uh, just my kids. So I thought, you know, what's a way that I can teach a lesson that's short and gets across an idea and could be accessed on a smartphone and uh, I thought, you know, YouTube is a good a good way to do that. I know the kids are addicted to it and it's not so hard to learn how to use it. And um, so I started doing twice a week these video lessons and the kids will uh, email me or they'll comment or they'll sort of engage with the video. I think I mean, they report that they all watch all of them. And I, I do think there's this like connectivity that springs up there. It, it, and I, I've been just trying to think of like different ways to reach kids who might not be able to use, um, to be use Zoom or use Google Hangouts or have, you know, class in a more traditional way. Yeah. One of the things that you talk about that really for me was kind of, um, 
just such a good point is the the privacy angle or the the sort of um, uh, desire to, to keep things personal. You know, we, I can remember, you know, anytime you've ever gone out as, as a Ute and seen one of your <laughs> teachers in public, it is a very awkward sort of, um, there's something very, it, it just doesn't make sense. And you kind of go, Oh man, you know, I think of you in this teaching capacity and to see you in public is a little bit different. And so there is a little bit of a separation there and you kind of, talk about that a little bit with using YouTube as opposed to Zoom where it's a back and forth. Right. I mean, a lot of kids don't want you to see inside their bedrooms or their kitchens or their houses. And like, that's also not our purview or our jobs as teachers to sort of, you know, be in that space that can feel very personal and private and need to be, you know, kept separate. Um, and so I, I feel pretty respectful of the sort of need for, for space and privacy that, that kids have. And we all have that. I would not want my teachers to see inside my room in high school. I would not have wanted that. I had a lot of weird posters up, no interest. (laughs) So, um, I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, also by giving them, you know, in, in the videos, I try to keep them light and um, include stuff from my life. I'm, I'm trying to sort of build a different kind of relationship because this is sort of an unprecedented. I mean, how many times have we said unprecedented in the last, mm-hmm. you know, two months? It's just a trillion times. Um, it's just it's a new we need to figure out ways to connect and it's scary. I mean, imagine being a kid right now. I just, I think about it every day. Like they're all kind of experiencing a trauma that that's just ongoing and very confusing. And it, it, I, they report feeling scared and confused. So just having something that is consistent and shows care and allows them to not have to give so much. I mean, this is not a time to expect a lot from students. It just isn't. It's a time to like provide a service to them while uh, we get through this period. Yeah, I think it's really refreshing to hear you say that because I totally and completely agree. You know, I I mean, I'm a parent. We have two daughters. They're more in grade school right now. But, you know, over the the course of the last couple of of weeks, you know, the question that my wife and I, you know, keep coming back around to is like, are are we doing enough to make sure that they're getting an education that is on par with what they're getting in school? And what I keep, you know, answering for, for at least for myself, which is we're doing the best that we can and that is good enough. And And if they're engaged in whatever way, like it's hard to compare apples to apples in this scenario, but they're also doing as good as they can, considering how how challenging everything is. Question I have for you is in going the route of, of putting something up on YouTube instead of a Zoom meeting, like it requires a certain level of technical uh, aptitude in order to put these together. Kids, especially kids are very familiar with what works on YouTube and what they're looking for. And, you know, the quick, fast edits and maybe music underneath and everything. All that goes out the window when you're doing a Zoom call. It's just like, hey, how's it going? Uh, but with a, <laughs> with a YouTube video, like there's a lot more of a, of a challenge there from a technical perspective. How do you balance that to be sure that you're providing like the, the, the appropriate amount of information for them to work off of and not spend all day editing your video? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, uh, that's really true. Um, however, it's also so much easier now than it ever has been to, to do cool things with just the video editing software that comes with your computer or even your phone. You can download like video editing software for five bucks. That's like way more powerful than anything that existed, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years, even 10 years ago, or even five. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not so hard to learn. It's pretty user friendly. And I guess I think that, um, so I personally, I don't have kids of my own. I have colleagues who do, and I wouldn't expect every teacher to be able to kind of spend time doing this, but I do have the time to do it. And it does mean a lot to the kids and the kids know how long it takes to make a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. So when they see that I've put in a little bit of extra effort and put some music underneath, that just comes with the, the software. It's not like I'm writing music or anything <laughs> or like doing the, you know, fast edits. Um, they, they notice and it, it like, it means something to them. I know, I only know that because they tell me I'm, you know, they're 
communicative. Um, It's just sort of the little things that you do as a teacher anyway to show kids, you know, you matter to me and you're special and I care about you. We can't do those in the classroom right now. So what are the ways that we can do things like that outside the classroom? Like if we have the capacity to give a little more, is it is it worth it? I mean, I would say it absolutely is worth it. It's like a gift that you can give. And also God bless you for uh, teaching your kid at home. I, it looks really hard and you're doing a good, yes, you're doing a good enough job. We do not know how this is all going to pan out. I mean, it, it's just a whole generation of, of kids who are going to have one, you know, semester that they didn't go to school. And that's a, that's a really weird new challenge. And I'm not sure how we'll rise to it. But in the meantime, yeah, I think taking care of yourself is the most important thing. And if, if you as a teacher can like give, I think another way to do it might be um, with like a, a tiny letter or sort of like a newsletter. Uh, or I also like draw coloring sheets for my kids and like make, they're in high school. So they really like coloring sheets. (laughs) 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 They're like the novelty is back, you know, anything. Right. So sort of like any way that you can figure out how to show the kids, um, that you're thinking about them, I think is, uh, is worth, worth doing right now. Yeah. I, you, you spoke about engagement, sort of um, you see this comment on your YouTube video and being able to respond to those and, and know that the students are tuning in. How does that compare to what other teachers are doing that's not within you know this uh, YouTube use that's with Zoom or you mentioned Google Classroom, I think? Yeah. Um, so I live with another teacher who works at the same school as I do. And, um, and it's just been, uh, she's also very well liked. She wins a lot of teaching awards and she, I might say she's one of the best liked teachers in the whole school. The engagement, (laughs) um, in my, like amongst my kids is just much higher than any, uh, engagement I've seen with, with, uh, with any other teacher, any other teacher has had, because it is, I think there's this monotony that happens. You have, you know, six teachers, they're all telling you to come to a Google Hangout. You know, you're sitting in front of your computer. It all kind of looks the same. You're kind of being asked to do a bunch of sort of like nebulous, like not super useful, busy work seeming activities. Um, I mean, they're on the lookout for something that is different and to like engage in a different way. So they, yeah, on my first video, I had every kid comment. I didn't ask them to, it just happened. And, um, that was awesome. I mean, I remember like that night looking at the comments and just getting all teary. I felt so grateful to hear from, cause I want, I'm worried about them. I want to know how they're doing. It feels like I'm tricking them a little bit into, you know, letting <laughs> me know that they're, that they're okay. But, um, but yeah, and now now we're really engaging more via uh, via email and Google Classroom because um, you know this is like a new time. Uh, I my boss asked me to please email all their parents and let them know I was communicating this way. I mean that's really important for parents to know. You know that your teachers on YouTube and, and it's okay for the kid to be like watching YouTube or to be communicating like that. But we also know that it's, you know, safer for the kids to engage in sort of a more like closed system. So that's what we're encouraging right now. But at the same time, I just, any way that I can know that they're okay is I I want it. I want it. I want to know they're okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, one last question I guess I'd have for you is, so then personally, outside of, of YouTube teaching, you having to do a lot of Zoom calls? Yeah, man. Like so <laughs> many. It's just like, and it's, it feels constant. And I, yeah, I, um, I'm going, cra- I feel like I'm going crazy. I feel like, uh, <laughs> don't you feel like you're going a little bit crazy? It's just yes. like so much of it. And there's yeah. always one person who like really doesn't understand how to use it and has the echo and, yes. you know, they don't realize it's them and you don't know how to be tactful. I mean, there could be a whole other article about like the, you know, new etiquette of Zoom <laughs> meetings and how to navigate. I'm sure there are sure there's 20 of those articles already. It's all we're talking about. So yeah, anything to get outside of that space, anything. 
<laughs> Please. Yeah. The first five minutes of, of everybody learning, they need to mute their mic. And then the last five minutes of everybody saying goodbye, 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 goodbye. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Uh, anything <laughs> yeah. to get outside of that. Yeah, uh, for real. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, well, Sophie Lucido Johnson, thank you so much for being with us here today. Everybody should definitely check out the article over on Medium's One Zero publication. Uh, if folks would like to follow you online, you have a Twitter account, anything like that. Where where should uh, yep. folks check out your work? I started Instagram. I'm at Sophie Lucido Johnson on Instagram and uh, Sophie Lucido Joe on Twitter. Awesome! Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, coming up, it's our stories of the week, or perhaps we should just rename it uh, to things that aren't happening because of COVID-19. <laughs> it's pretty much what it's going to be all about. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. As you're preparing your remote workforce, it's important to keep security top of mind with aiding employee productivity. Transitioning to a full work from home environment, as you've probably experienced, can be complicated. LastPass is here to make the transition easier without decreasing security. They're doing it in a number of ways. With security, with an uptick in coronavirus-related phishing attacks, LastPass reduces the risk of phishing schemes by never auto-filling passwords on suspicious websites. So they're protecting you there. For remote employees accessing your corporate VPN, LastPass adds an additional layer of security directly to your VPN through biometric multi-factor authentication. And there's access, regardless of where or how your employees need access, LastPass ensures your employees uh, have secure access to their work applications with SSO and password management. LastPass offers offline mode for both password management and multi-factor authentication so your employees can gain access no matter where they might be. Then there's sharing. Seamless collaboration with coworkers is essential when working remotely, as we're all very familiar at this point. LastPass enables remote employees to securely share passwords across teams in order to stay on top of critical projects. It's also simple. Man, LastPass is so simple to use. Intuitive admin and end user experience allows you to get up and running in minutes, not days. LastPass has a globally dispersed, ready to respond support and success team to aid with an efficient LastPass deployment. LastPass enables IT teams to remain in complete control over which employees are accessing which resources, no matter where they're working. For unified visibility, over access and authentication. Uh, of course, we use LastPass at Twit. We've used them for a while now. I've used them for even longer since before uh, LastPass was a sponsor on the network. I just love LastPass, and I, I tell everyone to use it just because it makes everything secure with my password management, my password health, and I want that for everyone. Uh, increased security doesn't have to be complex. Start your journey today by visiting lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. That's lastpass.com slash twit. All right. This is the part of the show where we usually talk about stories of the week. Um, but, you know, it's it's kind of like a downer story of the week <laughs> because it's, it's things that uh, maybe you were looking forward to and now you have to wait. So we've got to mm -hmm. wait. Uh, Mary Jo Foley from ZDNet and Twit's very own Windows Weekly is reporting her sources who share that Microsoft is pushing its Windows 10X foldable devices out of 2020 uh, oh. due to COVID-19 supply chain constrictions. So everybody was looking forward to uh, the Surface Neo. That's Microsoft's own foldable Windows 10X device. Um, that's not going to happen uh, this year. According to her sources, there has been no official word from Microsoft yet that I've seen, at least at, at, at the point of recording this show. Also not going to allow third party um, third parties to uh, release dual screen 10X devices uh, to ship in 2020 either. So if that's what you've been holding out for, you're going to hold out for a little bit longer and you can blame coronavirus for that. Kind of a bummer. I know a lot of people yeah. are looking forward to this. I was, I mean, holiday 2020, I was looking forward to this, the new Neo and Duo. Um, so I am a little bit bummed to hear that those are getting pushed back. I just think that they're fascinating products. And um, I like the tech that Microsoft makes, the hardware that Microsoft makes. It's been really interesting. So this is a bummer, but Mike, it makes sense. Mike, I might have some good news for you then. Because <gasps> what? 
this news applies only to their Windows 10X devices. So if you're holding out for the Surface Duo, oh. that's not, see, that's, according to sources, that's not delayed yet. That's still oh. uh, expected holiday 2020. So oh my a little good news to share, suppose, you know, uh, uh, supposedly, according to the sources anyways. I imagine this is one of those things that could definitely change. And when put in combination with, you know, Microsoft delaying the other devices as well, Microsoft uh, announced that they're going to hold all of their upcoming internal and external events online through July 2020. That's July of next year. So Microsoft's making big sweeping changes to a lot of things, maybe the duo gets delayed after all, but right now it's still earmarked. It's still marked for uh, holiday 2020. So I'm hoping. I really want to see that Android device as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, that so, yeah, that's not we'll so see. bad. We'll, yeah. we'll see. Okay. We'll see. Um. <laughs> so my story of the week uh, is a, a bummer. Um. So <laughs> the this is it's a little bit complicated. There is a group uh, called the Unicode. Consortium um, or consort consortium. Um, I used to pronounce it consortium, and then I learned it was cons consortium as opposed to pronouncing the T. Anyway, so the Unicode Consortium uh, is the group that is in charge of approving new emoji. Uh, they essentially the Unicode is the language of of text on the internet and in devices. And so regardless of what language you speak, if it is included in Unicode, then those characters can display across different devices. It uses codes, points instead of actual characters. And then the individual uh, devices can display the characters. That includes emoji. Well, the Unicode Consortium and the uh, Emoji Subcommittee have decided to delay the uh, emoji version that's coming in 2020 or, or until 2021 um, because, or excuse me, until 2022 rather, because of, uh, because of COVID-19, because of this novel coronavirus. So what does that mean exactly? It's just that the consortium for most of those folks, it is not their full-time job. Um, they are simply uh, specialists who come together and have these conversations and figure out how Unicode is going to go forward. And so given that, you know, a lot of people have a lot on their plate. So coming together to make the decisions for the next round of emoji is not something that they're able to do right now. So uh, there won't be new emoji in the coming year in 2021 and instead we will have a new release in 2022 now that said there are still new emoji on the way because there were some new ones that were announced as being approved uh and so those are probably going to be coming this fall so there will still be new emoji this year but in 2021 we are not likely to see new emoji uh, until those decisions are made that will then be pushed into 2022. Of course, mm -hmm. this on its face sad is... A, yeah, it's exactly. I wish I... Yeah, that's perfect. That is the sad emoji. Um, <laughs> this on its face is kind of a, a bummer. You know, folks like to get new emoji and um, have new ways of expressing themselves. Uh, emoji haters out there, I'm sorry for you. Have add some joy to your life, add some fun to your life, and maybe don't don't be grumpy. Um, <laughs> slash read Gretchen McCollum's book uh, called "Because Internet," because that'll also help you understand that uh, it is a beautiful flowering of our language as opposed to any sort of step back from um, from literacy. Anyway, now that I'm off of that little uh, soapbox, I'll just say that something that I think is going to be interesting is. For a long time, some of us in the tech space have posited that people who update their phones, many people who update their phones do so to get the new emoji characters that are added to the phone upon the update, as opposed to updating because, ooh, there's a new security patch out. I really have to get that. And so I'm curious how a lack of emoji in 2021 could impact folks' desire to update to the latest versions of their devices. Oh, so they scan the the, the update notes and like emoji, emoji, emoji. No, no emoji. <laughs> no, Forget no emoji. it. 
Oh, just bug just, fixes. And, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Who needs bug fixes? <laughs> I want the such and such face. I'm, I'm I not sure what face doesn't olive. exist in emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah. we all? Don't we all? Well, well I'm I smiling mean, the, good, <laughs> the, the good news is the emoji you already have isn't going anywhere. And it's a Correct. robust catalog at this Indeed. point. So... You know, there's a lot to choose from. I, I bet you no one who listens to this show, even the biggest emoji fan, has ever in their lifetime of using emoji used every single emoji that exists. So I believe you've got that, some catching 100%. up to do. You've got the time to apply that to your current find, scenario and start using those emoji you don't use. Yes, find new ways to use the emoji you have yet to use and then complain yes. after you've done exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> Jeremy Burge, who is, of course, the chief emoji officer with Emojipedia, um, kind of and also on the a subcommittee. And, and also on the subcommittee. You're right. You're right. Uh, kind of detailed some of this in his Twitter feed. Uh, so you can definitely look into that. He says there, it's possible there will be a minor emoji release for 2021 as a result of this comprised only of emoji sequences, uh, mm -hmm. which would be emoji 13.1. So iterative kind of update potentially as a result of all this before hopefully somewhere down the line a major update which includes the smiling olive that micah was talking about <laughs> yeah emoji sequences are very fascinating because it's a clever way to uh cheat at making new emoji without having to introduce new code points in in the code mm -hmm. in unicode so essentially what what they do is they take an emoji and a second emoji, and they use this special character in between called the zero width joiner. And by showing that on, by, by sending that to the device, you know, the, the, the operating system, it knows, oh, what you're asking me to do is take this emoji and this emoji and combine them together to make the new emoji. So they can introduce new characters without having to do new code. And so an example of this would be having the snowflake and then the zero width joiner and a polar bear, and or, excuse me, and a normal bear. And then when those are put together, the software knows to display a polar bear. So it's it's a really fascinating way. And that's how actually all of the different skin tone works, skin tones work for the different emojis. So the thumbs up that can be yellow or it can be these different uh, skin tones. There is a symbol that is the Fitzpatrick skin tone scale. And so it's a little square and then there's a zero width joiner and then it's whatever emoji. So the thumbs up, for example, and those actually combine in the software behind the scenes to make the thumbs up in the proper color that you're choosing. So super clever way to not introduce a bunch of new data by taking data that already exists and combining it using that zero width joiner. Man, Micah, you're like Twit's chief emoji officer. <laughs> I did a huge, uh, a huge sort of investigative piece uh, back when I worked for Newsy, uh, trying to learn how emoji worked and how they all came together. So yeah, I've got um, a lot of information from my work back then, and then continuing to be fascinated by it all. Um, I'm still work. I've got in the works a an emoji proposal. So one day I might be able to say. Yes, you see that emoji there, grandson? Uh, Your grandfather yeah. introduced that emoji. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get anything for it, but still it exists. <laughs> but it's not yeah. like real estate. Yeah, it's, it's right, not like a sadly. plot of land or anything. Uh, <laughs> Look, you know, property ownership is so 1492. <laughs> totally, totally. It's so, so then versus now but although now we're just pulled up in, in the property that we do have so i don't know Sigh. what now is anymore now is weird now is the end of the show is what it is <laughs> yes that's right thank you very much tech news weekly publishes every thursday at twitch.tv slash tnw that's where you can go to subscribe to the show audio video download it you know it's good to subscribe i'll just go ahead and say this it's good to subscribe because when you subscribe it, your podcatcher automatically downloads it for you. And when those downloads happen, we see that. On, on our side, our metrics show that you have downloaded the episode. And that's really good for us. So that goes a long way in keeping Twit, creating content, and bringing these shows to you. So we appreciate when you subscribe. Please do that. Twit.tv slash TNW. And you won't even have to think about getting it anymore. It just comes right to you. 
I think you've perfectly perfectly put uh you can be a part of the show by emailing us it's tnw at twit.tv and of course follow us on social media that's at twit on twitter at twit.tv on instagram at twit talk on tiktok i'm at micah sergeant on pretty much all the social platforms or you can go to chihuahua.coffee c-h-i-h-u-a-h-u-a.coffee uh which has links to the different things that i do online uh of course later today another episode of hands on ios will be published and we are talking control center i have gone in depth with control center telling you how to set it up exactly how you want it telling you what each of the individual buttons within Control Center means, how to access even more information within Control Center. It is take control of Control Center. And I'm really, really happy with this episode. I think that uh, folks on iOS are going to be helped by it immensely. At least that's my hope. So be sure to check that out later today, uh, hands on iOS. What about you, Jason Howell? Nice. Sounds great. At Jason Howell on Twitter. Of course, my hands-on show is hands-on Android, twit.tv slash HOA. New episode published this morning where I realized, hey, if you've got a library card and you've got an Android device, you have access to tons of free content. So, you know, audiobooks, movies, music, uh, comic books, uh, you name it, uh, everything, basically. Uh, you just plug in your library card into a number of apps, which I detail on twit.tv slash HOA, hands-on Android today's episode check it out and you won't be hurting for free content to listen to and to watch and read over the next uh however long we're in this mess um thanks to everyone who helps us do the show each and every week of course john uh back at the studio switching the, the feed for you all the tricaster hey. and then for Burke, I think, is engineering today. Or, and if not, I'm sorry, but whoever's engineering today, thank you. And thanks to you for watching and subscribing and listening and doing what you do. We couldn't do this without you. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Bye.